Sleepers Newscast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us at snoozecast.com and now also on YouTube, where you can listen to all our sleep stories and be one of the first to help us out by hitting the subscribe button. This episode is brought to you by Wreaths of Wildflowers. Tonight, we'll read the first part to The Fairy of the Dawn a Romanian fairy tale by German author Mitta Kremnitz. This story features a prince who doesn't seem likely at first to be as heroic as he turns out to be. He's more interested in singing and laughing than seeking adventure, fortune, or battles, as his brothers do. The author, Kremnitz, was born Marie von Bardelleben, and moved with her husband and children to Romania from Germany. There she became the maid of honor to the Romanian queen and fellow writer, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth herself had a reputation for being an eccentric dreamer. They wrote several books together under pen names, and Kremnitz went on to publish many books of her own, The other half of this story will air in the next episode. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Take a few deep breaths. Once upon a time, what should happen did happen. And if it had not happened, this tale would never have been told. There was once an emperor, very great and mighty and he ruled over an empire so large that no one knew where it began and where it ended. But if nobody could tell the exact extent of his sovereignty, everybody was aware that the emperor's right eye laughed while his left eye wept. One or two men of valor had the courage to go and ask him the reason of this strange fact. But he only laughed and said nothing. And the reason of the enmity between his two eyes was a secret only known to the monarch himself. And all the while, the emperor's sons were growing up. And such sons they were. All three like the morning stars in the sky. Florea, the eldest, was so tall and broad-shouldered that no man in the kingdom could approach him. Costan, the second, was quite different. Small of stature and slightly built, he had a strong arm and stronger wrist. Petro, The third and youngest was tall and thin, more like a girl than a boy. He spoke very little, but laughed and sang, sang and laughed, from morning till night. He was very seldom serious, but then he had a way when he was thinking of stroking his hair over his forehead, which made him look old enough to sit in his father's council. "'You're all grown up, Florea,' said Petru one day to his eldest brother. "'Why don't you go and ask father why one eye laughs and the other weeps?' But Florea would not go. He had learnt by experience that this question always soured his father's mood." Petru next went to Costan, but did not succeed any better with him. Well, well, as everyone else is afraid, I suppose I must do it myself. 
observed Petru at length. No sooner said than done, the boy went straight to his father and put his question to him. What business is it of yours? exclaimed the emperor in wrath. Petru returned to his brothers and told them what had befallen him, but not long after it struck him that his father's left eye seemed to weep less and the right eye to laugh more than before. I wonder if it has to do with me asking the question, he thought. I'll try again. After all, what do my feelings matter? So he put his question to his father for the second time and had the same answer. But now the left eye only wept now and then, while the right eye looked ten years younger. It really must be true, thought Petru. Now I know what I have to do. I shall have to go on putting that question to him, accepting his wrath, till both eyes laugh together. No sooner said than done. Petru, my dear boy, cried the emperor, both his eyes laughing together. I see you have got this on the brain. Well, I will let you into my secret. My right eye laughs when I look at my three sons and see how strong and handsome you all are. And the other eye weeps because I fear that when I am gone, you will not be able to keep the empire together and to protect it from its enemies. But if you can bring me water from the spring of the fairy of the dawn to bathe my eyes, then they will laugh evermore, for I shall know that my sons are brave enough to overcome any foe. Thus spoke the emperor, and Petru picked up his hat and went to find his brothers. The three young men took counsel together and talked the subject over well, as brothers should do. And the end of it was that Florea, as the eldest, went to the stables, chose the best and handsomest horse they contained, saddled him, and took leave of the court. I am starting at once, said he to his brothers, and if after a year, a month, a week, and a day, I have not returned with the water from the spring of the fairy of the dawn, you, Costin, had better come after me. So saying, he disappeared round a corner of the palace. For three days and three nights, he never slowed. Like a spirit, the horse flew over mountains and valleys till he came to the borders of the empire. Here was a deep trench that girdled it the whole way around, and there was only a single bridge by which the trench could be crossed. Florea made instantly for the bridge, and there pulled up to look around him once more to take leave of his native land. Then he turned, but before him was standing a dragon, a dragon with three heads, all with their mouths wide open, one jaw reaching to heaven and the other to earth. At this sight, Florea did not wait to give battle. He put spurs to his horse and dashed away, where he neither knew nor cared. The dragon heaved a sigh and vanished without leaving a trace behind him. A week went by. Florea did not return home. Two passed 
and nothing was heard of him. After a month, Costin began to haunt the stables and to look out for a horse himself. And the moment the year, the month, the week, and the day were over, Costan mounted his horse and took leave of his youngest brother. If I fail, then you come, said he, and followed the path that Floria had taken. The dragon on the bridge's three heads were more terrible than before, and the young hero rode away still faster than his brother had done. Nothing more was heard either of him or Florea, and Petru remained alone. I must go after my brothers, said Petru one day to his father. Go then, said his father, and may you have better luck than they. And he bade farewell to Petru, who rode straight to the borders of the kingdom. The dragon on the bridge was yet more dreadful than the one Florea and Costin had seen, for this one had seven heads instead of only three. Petru stopped for a moment when he caught sight of this creature. Then he found his voice. Get out of the way, cried he. Get out of the way, he repeated again, as the dragon did not move. Get out of the way, he said, as one final summons, and he drew his sword and rushed upon the dragon. In an instant the heavens seemed to darken round him, and he was surrounded by fire. Nothing but fire, whichever way he looked, for the dragon's seven heads were breathing flame. The horse neighed and reared, and Petru could not use the sword he had in readiness. Be quiet, this won't do, Petru said, dismounting hastily, but holding the bridle firmly in his left hand and grasping his sword in the right. But even so, he got on no better, for he could see nothing but fire and smoke. There's no help for it. I must go back and get a better horse, said he, and mounted again and rode homewards. At the gate of the palace, his nurse, old Birsha, was waiting for him eagerly. Ah, Petru, my son, I knew you would have to come back, she cried. You did not set about the matter properly. How ought I have to set about it? asked Petru, half angrily, half sadly. Look here, my boy, replied old Birsha. You can never reach the spring of the Fairy of the Dawn unless you ride the horse which your father, the Emperor, rode in his youth. Go and ask where it is to be found, and then mount it and be off with you. Petru thanked her heartily for her advice and went at once to make inquiries about the horse. By the light of my eyes, exclaimed the emperor, when Petru had put his question to him. Who has told you anything about that? It must have been that old Birsha. Have you lost your wits? Fifty years have passed since I was young, and who knows where the bones of my horse are buried, or whether a scrap of his reins still lie in his stall. I have forgotten all about him a long time ago. Petru turned away in frustration and went back to his old nurse. Do not be cast down, 
she said with a smile. If that is how the affair stands, all will go well. Go and fetch the scrap of the reins. I shall soon know what must be done. The place was full of saddles, bridles, and bits of leather. Petro picked up the oldest and blackest and most decayed pair of reins and brought them to the old woman who murmured something over them and sprinkled them with incense and held them out to the young man. Take the reins, said she, and strike them against the pillars of the house. Petru did what he was told, and scarcely had the reins touched the pillars when something happened, how, I have no idea, that made Petru stare with surprise. A horse stood before him, a horse whose equal in beauty the world had never seen, with a saddle on him of gold and precious stones, and with such a dazzling bridle, you hardly dared to look at it, lest you should lose your sight. A splendid horse, a splendid saddle, and a splendid bridle, all ready for the splendid young prince. Jump on the back of the brown horse, said the old woman, and she turned round and went into the house. The moment Petru was seated on the horse, he felt his arm three times as strong as before, and even his heart felt braver. Sit firmly in the saddle, my lord, for we have a long way to go and no time to waste, said the brown horse. And Petru soon saw that they were riding as no man and horse had ever ridden before. On the bridge stood a dragon, but not the same one as he had tried to fight with for this dragon had twelve heads, each shooting forth more terrible flames than the other. But he had met his match. Petru showed no fear, but rolled up his sleeves that his arms might be free. Get out of the way, he said when he had done but the dragon's heads only breathed forth more flames and smoke. Petru wasted no more words, but drew his sword and prepared to throw himself on the bridge. Stop a moment, be careful, my lord, put in the horse, and be sure you do what I tell you. Dig your spurs in my body. Draw your sword, and keep yourself ready, for we shall have to leap over both bridge and dragon, and if you need to use your sword, you must clean it and put it back before we get to the other side. So, Petru dug in his spurs, drew his sword, swashed it with focus in the air, and cleaned it carefully, putting the sword back in the sheath before the horse's hoofs touched the ground again. And in this fashion, they passed the bridge. But we have got to go further still, said Petru, after he had taken a farewell glance at his native land. Yes, forwards answered the horse, but you must tell me, my lord, at what speed you wish to go, like the wind, like thunder.
thought? Like desire? Or like a curse? Petru looked about him, up at the heavens, and down again to the earth. A desert lay spread out before him, whose aspect made his hair stand on end. It was so immense. We will ride at different speeds, said he, not so fast as to grow tired, nor so slow as to waste time. And so they rode, one day like the wind, the next like thought, the third and fourth like desire and like a curse, till they reached the borders of the desert. Now walk, said Petru, so that I may look about and see what I have never seen before. He rubbed his eyes like one who wakes from sleep, or like him who beholds something so strange. Before Petru lay a forest made of copper, with copper trees and copper leaves, with bushes and flowers of copper also. Petru stood and stared as a man does when he sees something that he has never seen before. Then he rode right into the wood, on each side of the way, the rows of flowers began to praise Petru and to try and persuade him to pick some of them and make himself a wreath. Take me, for I am lovely and can give strength to whoever plucks me, said one. They said such wonderful things to Petru in soft, sweet voices, if only he would pick them. Petru was not deaf to their persuasion, and was just stooping to pick one, when the horse sprang to one side. Why don't you stay still? asked Petru roughly. Do not pick the flowers, it will bring you bad luck, answered the horse. Why would it do that? These flowers are under a curse. Whoever plucks them must fight the goblin of the woods called Vilva. What kind of a goblin is the Vilva? Oh, just leave it be. But listen, look at the flowers as much as you like, but pick none. And the horse walked on slowly. Petru knew by experience that he would do well to attend to the horse's advice, so he made a great effort and tore his mind away from the flowers. But in vain, if a man is fated to be unlucky, unlucky he will be, whatever he may do. The flowers went on beseeching him, and his heart grew ever weaker. Mm, well, what must come will come, said Petru at length. At any rate, I shall see the Vilva of the woods, what she is like, in which way I had best fight her. If she is ordained to win over on me, well, then it will be so. But if not, I shall conquer her though she were twelve hundred vilvas. And once more he stooped down to gather the flowers. You have done very wrong, said the horse, but it can't be helped now. Get yourself ready for battle, for here is the vilva. Hardly had he done speaking, Scarcely had Petru twisted his flowers into a beautiful wreath, when a soft breeze arose on all sides at once. Out of the breeze came a storm wind, and the storm wind swelled and swelled till everything around 
was blotted out in darkness, and darkness covered them as with a thick cloak, while the earth swayed and shook under their feet. Are you afraid? asked the horse, shaking his mane. Not yet, replied Petro stoutly. What must come will come, whatever it is. Don't be afraid, said the horse. I will help you. Take the bridle from my neck and try to catch the vilva with it. The words were hardly spoken, and Petru had no time even to unbuckle the bridle when the vilva herself stood before him. She had a mane like a horse, horns like a deer, a face like a bear, eyes like a polecat, while her body had something of each. She did not fly through the air, but neither did she walk upon the earth. And that was the Vilva. Petru planted himself firmly in his stirrups and began to lay about him with his sword, but could feel nothing. A day and a night went by, and the fight was still undecided, but at last the Vilva began to pant for breath. She gasped and said, Let us wait a little and rest. Petru stopped and lowered his sword. You must not stop an instant, said the horse, and Petru gathered up all his strength and laid about him harder than ever. The Vilva gave a neigh like a horse and a howl like a wolf. For another day and night the battle raged on, and Petru grew so exhausted he could scarcely move his arm. Let us wait a little and rest, cried the Vilva for the second time, for I see you are as weary as I am. You must not stop an instant, said the horse. And Petru went on fighting, though he barely had strength to move his arm. But the Vilva had ceased to throw herself upon him, and began to deliver her blows cautiously, as if she had no longer power to strike. And on the third day they were still fighting, but as the morning sky began to redden, Petru somehow managed, how, I cannot tell, to throw the bridle over the head of the tired Vilva. In a moment, from the Vilva sprang a horse, the most beautiful horse in the world. Sweet be your life, for you have delivered me from my enchantment said he, and began to rub his nose against his brothers. And he told Petru his whole story, and how he had been bewitched for many years. So Petru tied the veil of a horse to his own horse and rode on. Where did he ride? That I cannot tell you. But he rode on fast till he got out of the copper wood. Stay still and let me look about and see what I never have seen before, said Petru again to his horse. For in front of him stretched a forest that was far more wonderful, as it was made of glistening trees and shining flowers. It was the silver wood as before, the flowers began to beg the young man to gather them. Do not pluck them, warned the Vilva horse, trotting beside him. For my brother is seven times stronger than I. But though Petru knew by experience what this meant, it was no use, 
and after a moment's hesitation, he began to gather the flowers and to twist himself a wreath. Then the storm wind howled louder, the earth trembled more, and the night grew darker than the first time, and the vilva of the silver wood came rushing on with seven times the speed of the other. For three days and three nights they fought, but at last Petru cast the bridle over the head of the second vilva. Sweet be your life, for you have delivered me from enchantment, said the second vilva, and they all journeyed on as before. But soon they came to a gold wood, more lovely far than the other two, and again Petru's companions pleaded with him to ride through it quickly and to leave the flowers alone. But Petru turned a deaf ear to all they said, and before he had woven his golden crown, he felt that something terrible that he could not see was coming near him right out of the earth. He drew his sword and made himself ready for the fight. I will lose, cried he, or he shall have my bridle over his head. He had hardly said the words, when a thick fog wrapped itself around him, and so thick was it that he could not see his own hand or hear the sound of his voice. For a day and a night he fought with his sword, without ever once seeing his enemy. Then suddenly the fog began to lighten. By dawn of the second day it had vanished altogether and the sun shone brightly in the heavens. It seemed to Petru that he had been born again, and the Vilva, she had vanished. You had better take breath now you can, for the fight will have to begin all over again, said the horse. What was it? asked Petru. It was the Vilva, replied the horse changed into a fog. Listen, she is coming again. And Petru had hardly drawn a long breath when he felt something approaching from the side, the what he could not tell. A river, yet not a river, for it seemed not to flow over the earth, but to go where it liked and to leave no trace of its passage. Woe be to me, cried Petru. Beware, and never stand still, called the brown horse, and more he could not say, for the water was choking him. The battle began anew. For a day and a night, Petru fought on, without knowing at whom or what he struck. At dawn on the second, he found that both of his feet were lame. Now I am done for, thought he, and his blows fell thicker and harder in his desperation. And the sun came out, and the water disappeared, without his knowing how or when. Take breath said the horse, for you have no time to lose. The Vilva will return in a moment. Petru made no reply, only wondered how, exhausted as he was, he should ever be able to carry on the fight. But he settled himself in his saddle, grasped his sword, and waited. And then something came to him. What? I cannot tell you. Perhaps, in his dreams, a man may see a creature which has what it has not got, and has not got what it has. At least, that was what the Vilva seemed like to Petru. She flew with her feet and walked with her wings. Her head was in her back, 
and her tail was on top of her body. Petru shook himself and took heart and fought as he had never yet fought before. As the day wore on, his strength began to fail. But when the gray light of the morning came, he was past standing on his feet and fought now upon his knees. Make one more struggle. It is nearly over now, said the horse, seeing that Petru's strength was waning fast. Petru wiped the sweat from his brow with his gauntlet and with a desperate effort rose to his feet. Strike the Vilva on the mouth with the bridle, said the horse, and Petru did it. The Vilva uttered a neigh so loud that Petru thought he would be deaf for life. And then, though she too was nearly spent, flung herself upon her enemy, but Petru was on the watch and threw the bridle over her head as she rushed on, so that when the day broke, there were three horses trotting beside him. The four horses galloped fast, and by nightfall, they were at the borders of the golden forest. Then Petru began to think of the crowns that he wore and what they had cost him. After all, what do I want with so many? I will keep the best, he said to himself, and taking off first the copper crown and then the silver, he threw them away. Stay, cried the horse. Do not throw them away. Perhaps we shall find them of use. Get down and pick them up. So, Petru got down and picked them up, and they all went on. In the evening, when the sun is getting low, and all the midges come out and fly around the meadow, Petru saw a wide heath stretching before him. At the same instant, the horse stood still.